If you've ever used the abort button in Kerbal Space Program, you've probably used it to activate a launch escape system. It's an effective way to spare the lives of Kerbals from a poorly designed launch vehicle. It's also the kind of button that you never need to use if all goes according to plan. But what if we controlled an entire moon mission from launch to splashdown using the abort button? Using only the abort button. That means no staging, no throttle, no SAS, no RCS, no attitude or translation control, and no action groups other than the one that could be activated with the abort button. Of course, we can't just toss all the engines into couplers into the abort action group and hope for the best. We need to find a way to use the abort button to control a staging sequence. If we link the toggle play action for a CAL controller to the abort action group, we can use the abort button to step through a planned sequence of actions. We can use this method to perform attitude maneuvers with rotors and we can have multiple cow units pass control authority from one to another. We can also get around having no throttle control by doing the whole mission with solid rocket boosters. We can start the vehicle pointing east on the pad and the launch profile can be tuned by adjusting the initial pitch angle and using small wings to provide passive stability during flight. For this challenge, I'll still allow the use of other game controls to move the camera, time accelerate, set maneuver nodes, and really anything else as long as it doesn't issue a control input to the vehicle. All right, first thing we need to do is set the moon as a target. We're going to be launching directly into our moon transfer orbit, so it needs to be at 35 degrees above the horizon at the time of launch. The launch separation and deployment sequence is fully automated using the first of four onboard Cal units. All we can do now is hit the abort button. The first thing the launch sequence does is release the launch clamps and activate all three solid rocket boosters. The aerodynamics of the vehicle keep it pointing prograde, and the steep trajectory helps keep our final inclination low. The two solid rocket boosters at the bottom have a higher thrust limit and less fuel than the one in the middle, so they'll burn out first and be decoupled. The entire injection burn to the moon is done while still in the atmosphere, so I can continue to utilize passive stability. Once the remaining SRB burns out, the fairing deploys and the SRB is decoupled. From there, the solar panels and landing legs are extended. We extend the landing legs right away because they increase the vehicle's moment of inertia, which will help it remain stable during maneuvers. The last action of the launch sequence is to activate the next CAL unit, the mid-course correction sequence. As you can see, our launch left us just shy of a moon encounter, but we're close enough that we'll be able to make up the rest of the delta V we need using four burns. These burns will be performed using pairs of sepatrons, and each pair provides just under eight meters per second of delta V. The sequence of mid-course correction maneuvers is controlled by the play sequence at the bottom but in between burns, I can pass control to the play sequence at the top. The top sequence controls the attitude maneuvers, and by turning rotors on and off, I can use them as reaction wheels to reorient the vehicle. Once we're lined up with the maneuver node, we pass control back to the mid-course correction sequence and activate the first pair of sepatrons. From here, we'll repeat the attitude and mid-course correction loop three more times to target the final landing trajectory. Our first three burns don't need to be very precise, as they're mainly used to push our orbit closer to the moon while doing some inclination correction. The vehicle has no yaw capability, but we only need to control two axes of rotation in order to obtain all of our desired attitude states, and leaving off the extra reaction wheels saves on weight. Furthermore, we can only pitch down, and we can only roll to the right. Programming the attitude control sequence to allow for choosing the direction of rotation would have required adding more complexity, and I wanted to keep things as simple as possible. The sepatrons provide a fixed delta V, so we need to fine tune the maneuver's impact by adjusting the time of the burn instead. The final orbit needs to have a periapsis of about 7,000 kilometers and an inclination close to zero in order for the landing sequence to work as intended. 
I'm able to pass control authority from one cal unit to another by assigning each of them the set play speed action of the others. All four cal units on board have their toggle play action linked to the abort action group, but only one of them ever has its play speed set to 100 at any given time. This lets me start and stop any active controller without affecting the others. Control authority can be passed during a one second window where the active play sequence briefly sets the speed of the next unit to 100 before setting it back to zero. Pressing the abort button during that window will toggle which unit is active, which causes the next unit to set the play speed of the previous one to zero, and the cycle repeats. Now that we've completed all four mid-course correction burns, we'll jettison the Cepatron stage and prepare for landing. Before we pass control authority over to the landing sequence, however, we need to perform one final attitude maneuver to set up for the first landing burn. The vehicle needs to be at just the right attitude at the start of the landing sequence, since we'll have very little attitude control throughout. We won't have time to use reaction wheels during the landing, so I'll need to control the attitude using sepatrons instead. Once in position, we exit the attitude control sequence and activate the landing and return sequence. At periapsis, we activate the first landing booster. This is the longest burn of the mission that has to be done without passive stability, so the vehicle's high moment of inertia is all we really have to keep it from veering off course. We'll use the entirety of this stage to capture and deorbit the vehicle, and it'll drop our surface speed to around 200 meters per second. Once we're below two kilometers, we'll fire one Sepatron to pitch up and then another to halt the rotation. The next booster is mounted above the capsule so I can detach it the moment our speed reaches zero, and I'm sure Bill won't mind being roasted for a few seconds. We then use another pair of Sepatrons to pitch vertical and perform a final landing burn to help slow our speed before touchdown. I've included an extra pair of Sepatrons facing up to help us stick the landing and prevent bouncing or flipping over, and there we go. We've officially made it to the moon using a single button. Bill has opted to commemorate this achievement by planting a flag before we use the aforementioned button to get him home. The return sequence is fairly straightforward. We start with a little hop to give us just enough hang time to point the vehicle vertical, and then activate the final booster. The exact burn performance doesn't really matter as long as the resulting periapsis is within Kerbin's atmosphere. It's not the prettiest return trajectory, but it'll get the job done. Prior to re-entry, we'll perform one final pitch maneuver to reorient the heat shield, since this descent will be pretty steep. All that's left to do now is activate the parachute and separate the capsule. So that's my take on a moon mission using only the abort button. I hope you found it interesting, and if you want to see more of this type of minimum control challenge, let me know. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.